what time it is? <laughs> Our writer, Ben Warheit, wrote a piece on the McRib, a sketch in which he referred to it as a seasonal menu item. Someone wrote, the McRib isn't seasonal. Seasonal would mean that it comes out every year for the same season, but its availability isn't determined by season, and McDonald's has gone several years in between releases. I knew that. I knew that when I read Ben's first draft, but I did not want to interfere with his piece. I, I think this says something about me as a boss, but I almost never give notes on my writer's pieces. I don't like to interfere with their vision. And I think the reason I don't do that can be summed up in one word, which is apathy. <laughs> I said ink blot tests. One of you told me ink blot tests are also known as Rorschach tests. And this is interesting. Uh, Rorschach tests are also known as ink blot tests. <laughs> so I guess we've reached an impasse. Talked about how we're going to write a song about the jackals, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles type song about, you know, grown ass online correction jackals. Zeros in a half shell. Chuck Lorre, we talked about the fact. Chuck Lorre, who created Big Bang Theory, wrote the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle theme song. But the Big Bang Theory song was written by Bare Naked Ladies. Yeah, written and performed by Bare Naked Ladies. Chuck Lorre was paid $2,000 to record Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Bare Naked Ladies were paid a million dollars. And I guess as soon as they were paid the million dollars, they spent it immediately. It was almost like they had a list of things they would do <laughs> if they had that much money. <laughs> they bought John Merrick's remains, Bays. <laughs> I think I finally figured it out. If he's an Italian artist, it's Michelangelo. If he's a turtle, he's Michelangelo. If he's a magician, he's Mike Angel. <laughs> this is just one of my celebrity stories within the body of corrections. I met Chris Angel, mind freak. I met him at a rooftop pool party in Las Vegas, i.e. his natural habitat. <laughs> and I, at the party, I was just going around to groups of people and I was just doing stand-up at them. I was just performing stand-up at people who were just trying to be at a party. No, wait, I got that wrong. He was doing magic. <laughs> and Chris Angel, mind freak, came up to me with a deck of cards, and I took a card, you know, nine of diamonds, put it back in, and then he's doing the start of the trick. And then this group of beautiful women enters the party, and uh, Chris Angel, mind freak, sees them, and just walks away from me, mid-trick. <laughs> Did not finish the trick. And then later, I walked over to him while he was doing, doing it to someone else, and I said, hey, you know, Chris Angel, mind free. Are you going to ever finish? <laughs> and he did this to me. This is what a magician did to me when I asked him just to show me my card. He went, be patient. And that's the last time I ever saw. That's the mind freak. There's no end to the trick. Someone said, which is some real, I think some parts of the world, they pronounce things differently, that sloth is pronounced sloth. I mean, come on, right? I'm not gonna start saying sloth. I would never remember it, that sloth rhymes with slow. I mean, if there was a mnemonic device of some kind. <laughs> I talked about watching our sloth, sloth, Serenity, uh, drive away the last time she was here and that she was driving and I mimed the steering wheel like this and you all pointed out that it would have been like this because she's a two-fingered sloth. But it definitely was this. And at this point, I'm starting to think this whole time it was a guy in a sloth suit. <laughs> in which case, I'm totally fine that we had him here. 
I said sloths were becoming a light motif for corrections, and I was told that light motif is only true for music. But to me, this is music. <laughs> uh, every now and then some people say some things that are not corrections, but rather just cruel comments. I wore uh, this hat uh, last week. I put this on, and um, someone said, that I looked like a grown, old, worn-out Ash Ketchum. In case you, like me, didn't know who that was, there you go. I'm just gonna go come right out and say that's a fair hit. Someone else said, we were talking about the length of corrections, maybe it's getting a little long. Someone said, I put this on, fell asleep, and dude was still going. Well, to you, I'd just like to say good morning. <laughs> I was talking about how people, I don't understand why people choose to watch this if they don't like it, because there's such a wealth of options on YouTube. And I, I basically, I said something along the lines of, you know, are you the kind of person when you walk into a grocery store, you just buy the first thing you see? You just go and take the tuna fish. And boy, oh boy, you all jumped on that and said, the fact, this proves this proves that you are a disconnected elite. <laughs> that you think you can walk into a grocery store and the first thing you see is tuna fish. Someone who shopped for their own groceries would know when you walk in, it's produce. That's the first thing you see. Well, I would just like to tell you that I shop for my groceries like everybody else. I just use the VIP entrance <laughs> that opens right into seafood. I said a doghouse, I corrected myself, a doghouse couldn't be hit by a meteorite because it's, uh, it's only a meteorite once it hits the ground. It would have been hit by a meteor. One of you very helpfully pointed out, if it bounced, it's a meteorite. Meteor, meteorite, doghouse, boom. Take it back. I said Lego blocks again instead of Lego bricks. This is the mistake I've maybe made the most often. At this point, I'm starting to think the reason is I don't give <laughs> I said about Wally, we're not trying to create another Frankenstein. And biggest correction of the week. How many of you said it's Frankenstein's monster? Well, I was actually doing something. I was giving all of you, collectively, what's known as the Jackal Briggs personality test where a person says Frankenstein and waits to see how many people say, uh, actually, it's Frankenstein's monster. And when they do that, you know they have a bad personality. <laughs> I was talking about Shoemaker. Shoemaker not here, still out, hoping to have him back for next week's corrections. Fingers crossed. Uh, Shoemaker is recovering uh, from his surgery. We're a little worried because he told us he was recovering from the Ritz-Carlton in Puerto Rico, and also our accountant called and said there's something, there's some irregularities <laughs> with the show's budget. So he's been zooming in. He looks great, like tanner than I've ever seen him, happy. Keep saying, he's like drinking from, he's got uh, umbrellas in his drinks and he says it's medicine. <laughs> so I was talking about Shoemaker and some of you said, why is he not at work? Because it doesn't seem like he has a job where he needs two legs. And I said, it's true. You never see him running down the hallway uh, like Holly Hunter, which was a reference to broadcast news. And then I caught myself in the moment and said, Joan Cusack, because I had misremembered it. And then I caught it in the moment. It was pretty impressive. And um, let's just I just want to show you that a clip of that moment so you can see how quickly I caught it. I don't think any of us can remember a time where like uh, Shoemaker was like doing the Holly Hunter run down the hallway, like the tapes. <laughs> oh, it was Joan Cusack. Caught it. Pretty fast catch. One of you in the comment section wrote, "It wasn't Holly Hunter. It was Joan Cusack." And you followed it up with, never mind, you caught it.
What did you do? <laughs> did you stop it after I made the mistake? Or did in that seven seconds, did you jackal paw out your correction? Now, let me just say, I tip my cap, which I'm told is this, to the fact that you're owning up to your mistake. But my God, the speed. You people want to be right. <laughs> All right. We talked about E.B. White's classic book, Stuart Little. I mentioned that one of the many weird details in the movie is that Stuart the mouse is born... Uh, sorry, one of the uh, weird details in the book, this is an important clarification, in the book is that Stuart the mouse is born to adult parents. Uh, many of you jumped in saying the Littles adopted Stuart, which is what they did in the movie. And when you, as a jackal, correct someone with a movie fact, when they're in fact talking about the book, you played yourself. Here's an amazing fact, though. Do you know who wrote the screenplay for Stuart Little? M. Night Shyamalan. That is true. How about that? How is that for a twist? <laughs> and he changed two, two major changes from the book to the movie in the M. Night screenplay. One is that Stuart was not born to the Littles. He was adopted. And two, at the end of the movie, this is not in the book, at the end of the movie, the dad, Frederick Little, says to his son, isn't it weird that everyone is cool with the fact that we have a mouse for a child? And Stuart says, that's because you've been dead for 10 years. Some of you said that I, by talking about the ending of the book, I ruined the ending of Stuart Little. That's not possible because there is no ending to Stuart Little. Just peters off. I told the story about how I wrote some extra lines in my head to my children about how Stuart at the end found Margolo, the bird he was looking for in the book. And now, this is maybe the best correction I've ever received, you guys. Someone wrote to us on Facebook, and this is a true story. They sent, they sent stuff. Hold on. This was Andrew Frischman. Thank you so much for doing this. I hope you're not catfishing us. I hope this is a real story. He wrote, in 1953, and again, my whole issue with Stuart Little, which was a book I loved, my kids loved, is at the end of the book, just sort of, there's no ending. In 1953, my mother, Kay Berthold, was about to turn 10 years old when she read Stuart Little by E.B. White, and like Seth Children, she was upset by the ending. So she wrote a letter to E.B. White, and E.B. White wrote her back. Her letter said, Dear Mr. White, I love Stuart Little, but I don't like the ending because I don't know whether he's going to get there or not. K. Berthold. And E.B. White's, and that's, by the way, he sent us this. There you go. That's what that looked like in 1953. And E.B. White wrote back, March 23rd, 1953, and wrote, Dear Kay, thanks for your letter about Stuart Little. Sorry the end doesn't sound right to you. It's too late to change it now, even if I wanted to, and I don't. All I can tell you is that Stuart was driving in a good car, loved to travel, and was headed in the right direction. I think it's a fine thing to be headed in the right direction, whether you find what you're looking for or not. Sincerely, E.B. White. Which is very beautiful. And I read that and was deeply moved. And I immediately knew the mistake I had made in being critical of Mr. White's amazing work. But then I read on and uh, Andrew added, so my correction is that even as Seth was trying to make the book more palatable to his children, Seth in fact ruined the author's very clear explicit intention to teach a broader life lesson. While I'm sure that Seth's book is destined to become a classic. It seems that Seth would be best off leaving the endings of books like Stuart Little to the original authors. Okay. <laughs> Little much. <laughs> um, I do, though. Uh, I have a book coming out. I'm not scared, you're scared. And this is very exciting. I talked to the publishers. And we are going to release two different versions of it. There's the original version, uh, which is the version I wrote. And then there's going to be an E.B. White version, which is the same version, but we're going to rip the last three pages out of it. <laughs> I mean, this is an amazing letter. It's 
That's so amazing. Thank you so much for sending it. And uh, thank you also for sending. This was cool because this is obviously a photocopy, but he sent us. Um, there was another. You guys see this? Which said, uh, Dear Kay, I wanted to follow up with one more thought. People who say actually it's Frankenstein's monster are huge ass. <laughs> Sincerely, E.B. White. P.S. Isn't it up that two humans had a kid mouse? <laughs> you can tell. It's look. As you tell, it's yeah. That's the day after. And that's obviously an old letter. Look at these, these discoloration. That's not, that's something that only happens in time. Um, I feel, felt like we went a little quicker today. I think that's good. I think we're all just like very excited for uh, Shoemaker to come back. Um, uh, went over everything we had. And...